Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we'll go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net to the side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came, into the came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Peter said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. The second time Jesus said to Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. Jesus said to Peter the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And Peter said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which you would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Hello. Hello. As many of you guys know, my name is Andrew, and I'll be doing the sermon along with Stephanie. <coughs> now, how many of you guys remember from last year? I made the 9:30 class, the 9:30 group, stand up and do some crazy stuff. So I promised them that I'll make you guys do the same. So I'm gonna actually need everybody to stand up. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna need everybody to slowly just spin around. I'm gonna do that five times, and once you hit five, once you hit five, I need you guys just yell hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, you guys can all sit down now. It took me a while to figure out what I was going to say for the sermon. So I, I did a little research. And according to Google, faith is defined as the complete trust or confidence in someone or something. Now, I believe this to be a valid definition, but it makes faith seem so unattainable. To have 100% faith means that there could be 100% no doubt. Now, this is where Google and I disagree, because I know for sure that I have gone through plenty of periods in my life doubting my faith. 
there's so many different religions out there that who's to say that they don't have a right and we have a wrong or that there is no God and it's just science. This is where faith plays a role. In every religion, science, or anything else that's out there, there are always uncertainties. No one knows for 100% if they are certain or right. If they say they do, well, good for them. But for the rest of us, it's like we're taking little pieces of a puzzle and trying to fit them together while some of the pieces are missing and everybody else is making their own puzzles and messing with ours. It just leads to greater confusion. How, however, I, I believe doubting is good in faith because it's by overcoming doubt that we can achieve greater faith. And Faith and doubt are two sides of the coin. You can't have one without the other. Just like you can't have Oreos without milk. You just have to have them together. Throughout my life, I've seen signs of God. And it's kind of hard because you just take a step back because we live in a lifestyle that's so rapid, we're moving through. And you just gotta take a step back, just look around. And one example I have is one of my first mission trips I went, we went to a small town called Sneedville, Tennessee. And one night we were tasked with going and writing on paper some of our doubts. And after that, we all took them and threw them into a fire. Now there's one paper that remained untouched in the fire. And it read, no doubts. No, no regrets, my bad. And it remained there until all the other papers burned away. And it wasn't until all the others that it too finally faded into the flames. It was as if God was saying he was there. He was looking at us. Another way I feel that God is here is there's this tiny voice inside your head. Some call it a conscience, but... I think it's the way that God talks to us. In Kings 19, Elijah listens for the Lord. A great and strong wind rent the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a still, small voice, and that was where the Lord was. A small voice that you listen to. Hmm, it's almost like I just said that. <laughs> you see, it's by doubting that our faith comes stronger. In the gospel, the disciples were fishing, and they had gone all night, hadn't caught anything. Then a man comes on the shore, I suppose yelling because he was pretty far out. Throw it to the other side. They had no reason to listen to him because before they were disciples, they were fishermen themselves. So they would know which side to fish on. So they had no real reason to listen to him. But they took the faith and decided to listen to him. Now, a counter argument can be made. For example, say I was to do an activity. I don't know, synchronized swimming. I clearly don't know what I'm doing, so I, don't, I probably won't do good at it. But if, we're, if a man came up and said, hey, it's not working out for you, but how about if you try this? I'm most likely gonna listen to him because why not? I have nothing to lose. It's just judgment calls, it's the my best interest. Why not? But they had to, the disciples and I, we had to make an initial leap of faith because to start, the disciples, they didn't have the authenticity of the, the man's word because they didn't know him or they thought they didn't. But 
It's by taking that initial leap that we're able to build trust. And you see, that's why faith doesn't exist solely in religion. Because religion isn't a tangible thing. You can't hold it. You can't see it. You can't smell it. It's because our faith exists in the people and things around us. And it's when people separate religion from their lives, it becomes an extra thing. Something that you have to go to every Sunday, and it's just extra. Now faith, like Christianity, is our lives. Not part of our lives. And it isn't until you acknowledge this that bonds are formed and church no longer is a hassle and faith is achievable. Jesus offers his help and in exchange, yes, just love him, to follow him, to trust him. Amen. Amen. Hi, I'm Stephanie, for those of you who don't know me. Um, I'm like Andrew, can I give a little quick sermon? At a very young age, I detested the water. I didn't understand what was so great about it. But around age, insert mom's memory of my age here, however, I couldn't be kept out of it. My parents began to call me Neptune's daughter. Though I don't know how or when, I attribute the shift from screaming bloody murder at the mere sight of H2O to refusing to quit splashing in it to one word, trust. I remember being at the side of the pool, not even at the deep end, terrified to jump in. My mother, my father, and my swimming instructor would all, at one point or another, ask me the same question. Do you trust me? Many head shakings and panic tears later, I somehow mustered the courage to say, maybe, then, okay, then, yes. Jumping off, at, off the edge at first is scary. There's fear and there's doubt, and there's temptation to back away. There's nothing holding on to you, and yet you have to believe that you will land, that you will be caught, that you will float. You put your complete faith in the hope that the person reaching out and smiling at you with wet hair will actually catch you and not let you drown. And once you can grasp that, any fear associated with the water disappears, and the initial inkling of faith grows deeper. And so it is with Jesus and Peter. For the sake of this parallel, we'll have Jesus as the swimming instructor. Jesus awaits Peter in the pool, Ray-Bans and lifeguard tube on hand. He asks Peter, who previously had denied his Lord over the smoke of a charcoal fire, the fundamental, fundamental, oh man, fundamental question of his faith, and the fundamental question of our faith. Do you love me? Jesus asked this question three times, in fact. And Peter does various tasks for him and answers every time with, you know that I love you. But Jesus wants to make sure. And finally, somewhat understandably, Peter gets a little irritated. Sometimes we, like Peter, will falter to answer this question. Sometimes we, like Peter, will answer and eventually wonder why someone keeps asking us that same question. We'll hesitate, we doubt, and we obey. But do we really love? What we need to understand is the depth of the question at hand. The love Jesus is inquiring about is not a preference, not a favoring, not an act of obedience. Rather, it is an unbreakable connection, devotion, and unwavering trust that commits the mind, the soul, the body, regardless of what fate may lie ahead or what fears may linger in our hearts. And Jesus wants to make sure even if it means asking three times in a row, that we are in it for the long haul, the right reasons, completely and selflessly. I think the Bible describes this best in Proverbs. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lead not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your paths straight. All too often, we try to rely on our own understanding and obsess over being in control. I get that, I can be an OCD clean freak at times. 
When we have to rely on others instead of ourselves, it feels like a loss of control and that makes us uncomfortable. But what we have to notice is that by doing just that, putting all of our faith into someone other than ourselves, like God, it's not a loss of control, but rather a gaining of it. Countless instances of the Bible echo the power and the strategy. From Daniel remaining calm in a den of lions to Abraham killing his only son, and ultimately, Jesus dying on the cross for us. I will not be the first or last to say that I have struggled at times with this answer. I've been asked the question of faith, perhaps not directly, but through situations and experiences in my lifetime. They echo throughout my daily life. Do you love me? Say the silent eyes of a lonely stranger looking for a friend. Do you love me? Say the arms of my little sister who dreads my leaving for college. Do you love me? Say the lips in the dark before sleep as future looms, daunting and fuzzy. Now, I can only hope, as someone who just turned 19 and hopes to live well into her 90s with a full head of long gray hair, um, that I will not end up necessarily like Peter, arms outstretched, taken in a place that I do not wish to go. However, I do admire Peter and his ability to meet his fate in a way that glorifies the Lord. And I especially admire his ability to drop all of his inhibitions, to follow Jesus down an uncertain path, and to realize and reaffirm his complete and total trust in the Lord, and to obey, not out of obligation, but out of faith out of Jesus' call to follow him. And it is then that I'm called back to that ledge with chlorine-scented abyss before me, in it a person, like Jesus, arms stretched out, inviting, asking for my trust. I can refuse, I can question the person in the water, or I could back away, afraid. Or I could say, yes, and close my eyes and hold my nose and take the plunge, relying on faith, that unbreakable connection, a devotion, an unwavering love to get into that water unharmed and safely float. And from personal experience, when you are willing to make that commitment and take the actions necessary to land in the water to the encouraging arms reaching out for you, and when you can say, Mom, I did it, and you can conquer the fear and the doubt and the fears of those challenges that exist all in daily life, it is worth its weight in gold. And faith grows, like Andrew said, out of doubt. And love grows. And we are fully committed to him, and we can answer Jesus' question every single day as it confronts us. Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. I know that I love you. Amen.